Hello online apologetic students. I want to introduce you to your reading for your third week and also your assignment. You will be reading this week in Christian Apologetics in Anthology of Primary Sources, again by Swice and Meister. Right here you will not be re reading this week in Phillips and Oakholm. And you will also be watching another video of mine that I recorded recently of a sit-down session that I had with students. I have that video linked within the Populi system on the lessons page. You want to be sure to watch that this week. And I want to introduce you to your reading in Meister as it pertains to your posting assignment for this week. You're going to be reading chapters 19 and 20. Chapter 19 is a section of writing by Teresa of Avila. She was a Carmelite nun, a Catholic nun, who wrote in the Middle Ages on her experiences with God. The name of her book was The Interior Castle, and I've actually read the whole of that book, and it is really powerful. I have a lot of notes that I took when I read that book. You're reading just one very small section of her encounters with God, what she would call her encounters with God, specifically as she has had to as she had to prove them to her superiors, her confessors, I think she calls them, who were objecting to her experiences and even saying that they were of the devil. And so you have some of her, sometimes it kind of sounds like she rambles, but she explains in great detail some of her visions and experiences with God as a way of defending them to those that were criticizing her and were wanting her to reject them. I want you to pay attention to the details of her experiences that she gives that we'll call religious experience for the purpose of this study this week and how she felt the need to defend them to those that were criticizing her. One thing I want to draw a line between is the difference between religious experience and spiritual experience. Maybe we treat them as the same, but for the topic that you're reading on, when they say religious experience, and it's often referred to in chapter 20 of Meister as RE, he gives a lot of abbreviations, he's technical, whereas Teresa is very conversational, it's an old writing, um, the next author is rather technical, and RE, standing for religious experience, is meant to communicate the idea of a major experience, a major spiritual encounter, religious experience with God that is transformative, is memorable, is dynamic or dramatic, something that we would often call in society, including the non-believing society, would recognize as being, oh, that's what's called a religious experience. I want you to notice the difference between that, something very major, and what we often refer to as spiritual experiences. I have spiritual experiences on a regular basis in my life. I experience spiritually the power of music. I, it is very spiritual for me to... Um, take a walk alone in the forest and be surrounded by God's creation, for me that is a very spiritual experience. And I do find the Lord in those things in ways. Um, I have a spiritual experience most often um, when I am gathered together with friends. And if you would just let me sound a little bit kooky here for a moment, when I'm with friends and I'm happy and having a great time and laughing to me, that is very much a part of spirituality as I am as a person and a human being, but I would not call that a religious experience per se. And so I want to make a difference between the two so that when you're reading in chapter 20 about religious experience, you're not thinking of even something uh, as familiar as the kind of heightened perception and awareness that you might have when you are singing songs of worship or the goosebumps that come sometimes in, um, you know, during a song, uh, singing worship and song. Those things may very well be spiritual and sometimes involving an encounter with God. But here in this 
topic of apologetics, we're talking about major religious experiences that are transformative in power. And those may very well have happened to you, and I have had them happen to me in uh, services of worship and in Christian meetings. And I've also had some happen elsewhere. It's the major ones that we want to think about. Teresa describing some of hers, um, being a Carmelite nun who entered into deep mystical union with God through a lifetime of prayer and contemplation. And uh, she's grappling with some that were saying that her experiences were of the devil. In the rest of her book, it's very interesting. I don't think you get any of this in this little bit that you get from her in chapter 19. But in the whole of her book, she describes times of being overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and unable to function. She uh, describes receiving visions, speaking in tongues, and even hearing God calling her to share Jesus with other people. And yet there were superiors who said to her, this sounds like something from the devil. And I would like to ask you the question, what do you think when you hear the way that she described them in the outcome? But moving on to chapter 20 by William Olson, a much more challenging chapter. I want to go over some terms that will help you if you know what these are before you start reading Olson's chapter. SP, he will very quickly start using the letters SP together to refer to something. And the, from the best that I can get from him, he's meaning sensory perception of the natural physical world. Whenever you see him write SP, he's meaning sensory perception of what is easily discerned in our physical experience of life, the world around us. Our experience is in the sensory world of the five senses, very easy to judge, very easy to check and analyze because they happen every day all throughout our daily existence and um, easily explained and shown to others who have almost certainly experienced the same things. SP. RE, I mentioned it earlier, is religious experience. This is something different that is not analyzed in the same way or at least as a part of the conversation in his chapter with objections and then his answers is something different than the sensory uh, perception in the natural world. He also refers on a number of occasions to something he calls overrider systems. Overrider systems. What is that? As I read him, I understood that to be traditional beliefs that give rise to bodies of doctrine and practice passed down in a religious system. So we could say tradition, but he's going after something a little more um, uh, a little more expansive, uh, expansive than that. Overrider systems are traditional beliefs that he will use as a way of saying this is one important way to check or to analyze the religious experience a person has. Does it line up with overriding systems of traditions and beliefs um, that have been passed down and does it have a match with others? Interesting way of looking at it. Also, he will sometimes write uh, and use the phrase prima fascia. Prima fascia, uh, the Latin meaning on first view or impression without testing or examining something further. Making a decision about something at first view or first impression without giving it any further examination or analysis. And when you read Prima fascia, that's what he means. Um, what I want you to read most carefully, really, you don't need to read the whole of the chapter, except objection number four, five, six, and seven. Uh, I believe it begins on page 198, and then also the author's answer to each of those objections, which he includes right after the objections. Objection number four is that religious experiences, remember the major kinds, have naturalistic explanations, especially in psychological and physiological realms. And I'm just summarizing here, but you're going to want to uh, read the whole. His answer is that, yes, but this could very well be a part of God's design for religious experiences, that they are meant to involve our physical person and self, psychologically and physiologically. 
I would say that there is a weakness in his answer to number four in that not all experiences that he would refer to as religious experiences um, could be classified as major religious experiences. Once he starts talking about, about psychological uh, considerations and physiological, a lot of our spirituality is very connected to our psychological states and physiological makeup. Um, so then we get into other conversations about awakening and spiritual experiences at a lesser level, if you will, of major religious experiences. So probably for the re purpose of being brief in his chapter, he doesn't get into all of that, but it's kind of a weakness in that it leaves it open. But if you have the separation between major religious experience in mind and what I'm just saying for this way of looking at it, lesser spiritual experiences, then that will help in getting the gist of what he is saying. Objection number five, that there is a big difference, this is objection to religious experience, that they're worth anything for proving a faith to be true. This is the background, that religious experience can be used to prove faith. The objection number five to that in his chapter is that there is a big difference between sensory perceptions verifiability and the verifiability of religious experience. And his answer is that uh, the differences are not reason to say that one is real and the other is not. Yes, there is a different way to verify our experiences in the sensory physical world. It's easy to verify. And there is a different way of verifying religious experience because it is so subjective. His answer is that that is not reason to keep one and throw the other out. And so that's just pretty logical. Um, but he does acknowledge that there are significant differences between the two. Moving right along quickly here, objection number six is that sensory perceptions have plenty of checks to verify it. So he's just kind of breaking down off of some of the earlier objections, uh, taking some subpoints. There are plenty of checks for sensory perceptions experiences, and religious experiences have very little, little systems to check and verify or validate their worth for proving something to be true. And I think his answer is very interesting. This is where he looks at overriding systems or traditions as a way of looking at what a person is saying has happened to them. Does it line up with affirmations of a tradition? of faith. How does the how do the reports and testimonies and views of people in that faith or group line up with the person's experience? I think that's very interesting and I think it is actually an important check although even biblically speaking we can find people in the New Testament having things happen to them that don't necessarily line up directly with something uh, that we can pinpoint elsewhere before their time, earlier in the uh, time of Jesus, or in the Old Testament that we could say, oh, aha, there it is, perfectly lining up. But I think as far as church history goes through the ages, this is worthwhile when we think about someone's experience and using that in their life as a way of saying, this helps me validate my faith, then we want to ask the question, how does this line up with others? and their affirmations and their testimonies and things. And the, the interesting thing is then that answer brings up what I think is the most important objection of them all, or the one maybe that we would encounter the most, and that's objection number seven, beginning on page 200, is that the pluralistic nature of religious experience across the world and ages, this is an objection, means we cannot expect to find any real value in one religion's religious experience as being a proof for their faith because all religions have religious experiences. And I would say that is the most significant of all of the challenges that we face because other religions and beliefs in, in the world do have religious experiences, major religious experiences. How can we answer that? There's a number of ways, and it's a huge conversation. And once again, to stay short, to stay brief in his work there, 
he acknowledges that yes this is a major problem and that um, one of his what I felt was one of his most helpful answers was uh, using his words is that if we allow for enough time to see if the religious system that that person with the experience is coming out of, if we allow enough time to see if that system of beliefs fulfills their own promises more fully than others. In other words, if we look at what is coming out of that movement, those people and those beliefs, how is it affecting their lives, what is happening, and the promises that that faith or tradition or religion makes, is it being fulfilled in the lives of its people and followers and believers? Are the good things being promised, showing up in their lives? Is human flourishing, which would be an underlying promise, I would say, of most religions and beliefs, is human flourishing resulting from that system of beliefs and those experiences? That question and the answer, which will take time and will take examination, and I would say we've had the time, at least up to now, when we look at things in the past. Um, this can be used as a way of selecting, if we're stepping back from all allegiance to any faith or belief, for a moment at least, to say which one is real, which one's, which one's the best. We can step back and look at how they have fulfilled their promises and use that as a system of making an affirmation of which one seems to be the most true. And again, that requires stepping back um, and dealing honestly with the outcomes. So I thought that that was very interesting and a helpful way of dealing with pluralism when we're allowing in the arena an examination of all things and, and leaving everything open to question. Um, so uh, that's uh, what I want you to pay attention to, objections number four through seven also to watch the video and then your assignment this week is this and this is described in these words in Populi, but I want to go over this with you um, this week's posting topic once you have read chapter 19 and 20 Teresa of Avila's writing from her interior castle her vision of the human experience of being filled up with God and then chapter 20's objections, here's what I want you to do in your post. When you think of the arguments against religious experiences as being anything valid or worth using for verifying faith, and the way that Teresa of Avila was so clearly facing criticism and rejection from her superiors for her testimonies of experiences, I would like for you to consider your own religious experiences, both small and great, whatever has happened to you over the years. You may not even call them religious experiences. I generally don't use that wording to describe things that have happened to me, but the way we're approaching it here and the, and the wording used in the book, we'll call it that. Think about your own experiences over the years, things that have happened to you, small and great, and how they have impacted your faith directly and your belief, your trust in the claims of the Christian faith. And I have a number of questions here. Have any of them been so supernatural that they defy naturalistic explanations? Anything that has happened to you? The next question, did you discover later that others in the faith have had similar things happen, giving further affirmation to your experience? And then I guess the opposite of that would be worth thinking about. Do you feel like this is something that has happened only to you? And the next question, have any of them, any of your experiences been lesser in significance, if you would allow me to speak of it that way, but still enriching and satisfying to you spiritually, something that continues to be meaningful, you, meaningful to you, though more open to criticism for its worth or their worth in actually proving faith. What I'm getting at there is oh, that may not be the kinds of things you would want to say this is proof of the validity of my faith. 
And I'm getting at the tendency we have in our world and society today to rely on experience, even, um, could I say, more common experiences. So, um, and, and again, I don't have the time to qualify what I'm saying and uh, to try to remove offenses or anything, but I think you know when I'm getting at the difference between major experiences or encounters and something more minor. You can look at those questions. They're in the posting uh, description for week three. Oh, and the last question, have you ever been frightened or alarmed by a religious or spiritual experience? Have you ever been frightened or alarmed? Do you have something still inside of you, some fear of these things? I've known people very close to me, afraid of spiritual experience because of things that have happened to them. It's worth thinking about. Your post can pick up any one of these one or two of these questions. I'd like you to pick one or two at the most so that you have room to really get into them. Um, you don't need to cover them all. Add your post to the week three online discussion posting in the discussions tab in Populi. And your post is due by Friday midnight, May 22nd. And I'll look forward to interacting with you online. Blessings.